Welcome to The Chase Hudson Show, a podcast dedicated to inspiring you to become extraordinary. Each week, we sit down with top-tier business owners, real estate investors, and influencers to inspire you to build your legacy. It's time to level up. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the show. Today we have John Sperry, who's the co-founder of Halo Site, as well as In Moment, um, two very prominent tech firms here in, in Utah. A really awesome conversation. Uh, John is a serial entrepreneur. He had a, a, a really great exit with In Moment um, and, and working on building Halo Site currently. We talk about raising capital. Uh, we talk about building tech companies from, from ground up. He makes recommendations around um, hiring and and uh, raising capital and, and thinking about exiting uh, companies. Really, really fascinating conversation. I'm excited for you guys to hear John uh, and his experience. And with that, let's dive in. Hey, everybody! Welcome to another episode of the show. Today we have John Sperry. Who is the co-founder of Halo Site, an augmented analytics company built natively for the Salesforce App Exchange, which you'll have to explain to me in more in more English terms. Uh, but before founding Halo Site, John founded InMoment, a leader in the customer experience space. He grew InMoment for 17 years and ultimately exited to a Chicago-based private equity firm. In 2016, John was named CEO of the Year by Utah Business Magazine and EY Entrepreneur of the Year in that same year, if I, if I have that right. That's right. So That's right. quite the background, John. Um, really excited to have you in and be able to share your stories. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's great. Well, the first question I usually ask my guests, John, is to talk a little bit about your upbringing. Um, before we started recording, you mentioned your, your father was an entrepreneur. So yep. yeah, would love to hear what people should know about your background to understand who you are today. Yeah, I think um, a lot of, me, of my background is hard work. I think that's true of any entrepreneur, but, uh, you know, for me, it was always doing projects and work with my dad, you know, building things and, and, uh, you know, valuing uh, work. And it wasn't, you know, I, I never thought it was a chore to me. It was just always fun to do those kind of projects. I look forward to them. And so that's something that's, I was just grown up with and relishing that opportunity to, to do those kind of things, uh, those kind of challenges. And now they've just gotten so much easier. It's like anybody can become a, a B student at anything with YouTube, it feels like. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah. I'll, let me go look. I'll go see if I can kind of become okay at that using YouTube. And right. it's kind of crazy that, I mean, you, you don't sit there and say, I can't do that because I don't have domain expertise, right? And that's the thing that's kind of changed. In the past, you had to choose that path ahead of time, really know where you were going. And now there's all sorts of tools. So I think the most important thing for me was I valued work. I love doing that. I love learning that curious, you know, intent of, of wanting to gain more, I think is really important. And so that's, a, that's probably the most important thing about me is I, I love to learn new stuff. I love to read. I, I read a couple books every week. I'm always reading and I enjoy that. I, I, I do a kind of a fun book, you know, kind of, you know, as well as workbook. I, I don't, I don't do just workbooks that's terrible yeah <laughs> those are, those are sometimes up. a little harder to fight through sure uh, but that's that's a little bit of my background i've always just grown up sort of reading and really valuing work yeah that makes sense and and what uh you mentioned your father what line of of work or entrepreneurship did he find himself so in he uh was an ibm guy yeah uh for a long time selling for ibm selling software and so that it was what he spent his time in and then uh, we moved back here to utah and he started up a software company for translation. It was called ALPS, Automatic Language Processing Systems. And the, well, to kind of put it in perspective, he had computers that would fill this room that were almost as powerful as your iPhone. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind yeah. of crazy. You know, you look back at that and just, but they, they basically built a company to translate. And it was this huge endeavor to go through and do that. So it was just kind of long before all the Google translates and every and Babelfish and everything else that came along. It was just to do brute force translation. And how did, how did you seeing that impact? I mean, how old were you? Did that, do you remember that? Was that impactful in, in establishing kind of your path or what you ended up doing? Yeah. I used to, I used to travel with my dad when he was an IBM sales guy. And I remember driving with him one time. Uh, I was probably 12 
I were driving up to some place in Idaho to sell some big Series 6 IBM mainframe thing. <laughs> and uh, he had me go off to talk with some of the techs because he had to do the sales thing. So I came with him and went over and sat down and was talking with the techs. And they were sitting there on their green screens typing in questions into this interface. It was just, you know, it was just a text interface and getting answers back. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, oh, we're playing this game on ARPANET. And I'm like, what's ARPANET? <laughs> and that was long before the internet. That was the old military and, and uh, educational uh, network that was shared mm. among six main sites. And it was kind of cool. And I, they were just playing a text-based uh, adventure game. Kind of cool. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So you had the influence of, of hard work, your father, and then I, I read that you went to BYU and subsequently um, got your MBA at yep. the U of U. What was your thought process going into school? I mean, did you have the desire, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to do, I want to do something on my own, or was it I'm going to go get a, a good job and learn? What was the mentality? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And um, I did not think I was going to be an entrepreneur when I was in school. I thought I was, I was really interested in the tech. I was super excited about kind of the things that were happening. I mean, most of the job descriptions today in technology didn't even exist when I was in school. Sure. And so it was, it was fun to, you know, I mean, I basically got a, I, I got my finance and, and, and business degree and then my master's. And then my first job was at a software company and they handed me a bunch of C code and said, we need you to get this working. And I'm like, didn't think that's what I was going to be doing today. <laughs> so, so I'm like, better know. I mean, and I knew some C, but not much. And uh, had to bone up real quick my first couple of weeks of work and say, well, I guess I'm doing C code. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, uh, just, but it was what I wanted to get into. It was, some, it was, it was interesting. And I think that's something to kind of take away from, is that if it's interesting to you, it's just a lot easier to do. And I, I kind of always break things down as, hey, there's what you're good at. There's what you're interested in. And there's what pays well. Right. <laughs> it's good to get two of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For two out of job. three is good. Two out of three is pretty good. Yeah. And uh, that, that's, that can make it interesting. You're lucky when you get all three. Right. I agree. And so you, you get your first job. Was that at Sterling Wentworth or is that, or Wentworth or was that? Yeah, at, it was. It was okay. Sterling Wentworth and it was a financial software company. And, uh, with my finance background, I was building financial models for predictions and extrapolating for investments and retirements and tax equations and state credit. It's real super boring stuff. Sure. <laughs> I was like, Ugh. but it was interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, good learning ground sounds yeah, like a great, great place to learn. Yeah. And then subsequently I saw you, um, spend some time with SunGuard and Blue Step. Yep. Um, what was your experience like with those groups? Yeah, I, I moved up into the executive tier right before we got acquired by SunGuard at Sterling. Okay, got it. And um, took over as you know VP of technology with SunGuard. SunGuard, they acquired like 80 companies. It was a big organization. And our little division at that point in time, they kind of wanted just to milk it. And I'm, I'm a creator, and I, I, I'm not a maintainer. Mm -hmm. And it just... After like nine months, I was like, someone else can do this. So got I it. left. <laughs> okay, got it. And I went to a dot-com. I mean, literally, it was right during the dot-com explosion. And I went over to Blue Step uh, and met a bunch of the people that I'm still working with today. And uh, we've worked hard for two and a half years. Those dot-com days were like uh, dog years, though. Mm. It was 15 years, actually. And <laughs> it was only two and a half, but it <laughs> felt like 15. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I still look back in that kind of shudder. We... We work 20 hour days like wow. all the time. It was just crazy. And and it was just super unbalanced. Let's just say that. Sure. But, you know, it was, I found out the other day um, some of the people I worked with, the, the code is still running for healthcare company. I was like, really? It's still it's still around? <laughs> it's like 20 years later. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that was that was an interesting experience. I made a lot of good connections in the, the VC and investment community. And that allowed me to go start my next company, which was in moment. Okay. Yeah. So we yeah, had the out coming out of blue step, I guess I always like to talk about that transition yeah. into yeah. entrepreneurship and taking that step and deciding, I guess what, yeah, what was that period like when you're, you're done at blue step and like, Hey, this is, this is what I want to do. And how, how did that, you know, kind of come to fruition? It, you know, sometimes you just have this moment where you're like, well, I'm going to take the risk. And for me, it was at the end of Blue Step where there were 500 companies that died in the dot-com the quarter that 
our company, Blue Step, died. Well, we sold it off for, I, I'll call it a death. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was a okay. quasi death. Okay. It, was, it wasn't a success. Let's call it that. Okay. Because we, we sold off the assets and a different group took over and it was a small team and the rest of us basically had to go get jobs. Okay. And so I'm closing the doors on the on that business as a CTO there and just having to walk away and not be paid for like the last three or four weeks as we basically sweep the floors. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And so we filled out resumes with employees, tried to help people find jobs, all that kind of stuff, right? Because it was like, well, this didn't happen. But <clears throat> we took away a lot of really interesting things. And so I remember reading in... Um, magazine uh ink magazine and it it listed that 500 companies had gone belly up that quarter and i thought okay i'm headed out to find a job and there's 500 ctos who just lost their job that i'm going to be competing against sure yeah <laughs> there's only one in a company <laughs> right <laughs> you're like hmm. <laughs> so i started hooking up with some of the vcs and looking out different opportunities i thought i'm going to try to find something that i can do and I ultimately ran into a couple of friends I hadn't seen since school and they had an idea and I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting, but we need to adjust it a little bit. And, and before you know it, we were like building this company and it was really kind of weird because I, a bunch of the people who didn't have jobs, I'm like, well, Hey, if you want to park your, your email here and say you work here, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, we'll come there and do that. You know, so everybody's working for free. There's no money. And it's 2002. And Utah, in Utah, this is a crazy thing. We, we, we talk about the billions of dollars that come in every year in investment in our community now. Guess how many dollars were raised in 2002? I assume not a lot. Five million. Yeah. For the whole state. That's crazy. It was a dearth. So there was no money going out. So, I mean, we, we, a lot of us were like just working, thinking, okay, we'll just do this until we find a job because it's easier to find a job when you have one. Mm -hmm. So we're just working. There's like 10 of us no pay. And before you know it, we're like, I think this actually is a company. <laughs> it was like kind of ironic. I mean, I was all in, but I, I didn't want these other people who were just, I was like, you know what? I understand, you know, if you're here and you can do that, great. But you know, so it was this kind of awkwardness of where the other company had died and I'm like, well, we should do something. And, and before you know it, I was like, no, we really should do something. <laughs> it's like sitting down with everybody going, I know uh, like most of us still have our resumes out, but we should do this. <laughs> and it was this kind of wild moment. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, I think we are doing this. <laughs> and it was kind of a, it was a cool because it was a bunch of us doing it, right? And we we're like, let's go build this. Specifically, Kurt Williams uh, with me, he, he, he and I were the key kind of pushers behind that. And, and a few other people uh, that, that kind of were there as well. And uh, it just it was kind of a neat experience that way, right? Yeah. And everyone realized, well, I guess we can take our resumes down, <laughs> right? <laughs> we got a company. <laughs> yeah, kind of cool. Sounds like yeah, very organic. Just kind of happened. You guys are working together as a team. You know, and... we're, you know, when there's no other way up, and you just don't want to sit at home and do anything, I'll go yeah. work at trying to build a business. And right. That's what we did. Yeah. And you know, we had people that went without pay for a, a bunch of people for over a year, and so it was a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice. And then we got a big contract. We had like $9,000 in revenue. It was like nothing. It was, wasn't enough to do anything, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it was like $9,000 in ARR. And um, we sold this million dollar contract to Gray Clips. And they said, can we pay you guys up front? We don't want to do this monthly. And we're like, okay, if you make us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> like, all of us are running around going, holy crap. You know, we, we got that in like February. And within four months, we had $3 million in revenue. Wow. And... We were a company and it was just kind of a cool thing that we went yeah. through and said we did it yeah and uh, pulled that you know hard work off it takes a lot of hard work it's amazing and I, I like your point you brought up about the catalyst of leaving blue blue step right i mean you, you kind of had your hand forced a little bit where it's like i i no longer am employed market's not great might as well take advantage of this opportunity and i think that's the way to look at it yeah because i think a lot of times entrepreneurs I, people have big aspirations and I was like this too. It was like, I, I want to be an entrepreneur, but what was going to kind of get me out of the day to day, the nine to five, what was going to be that catalyst? And, and similar thing kind of happened to me where 
I needed, I got that push and yeah. I just said, okay, it's sink or swim, you know, you got to make it happen. So sometimes that's for, sometimes it's voluntary, I, but either I, way, I think as long as that door is opening, you take advantage of it. Yeah. And there's, there was plenty of reasons why I, I didn't have to go start a business. I could have done a lot of other things. It would have been easier. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, they were paying me, you know, VC firms were paying me to go out and research different tech companies. And mm-hmm. that was a lot easier than <laughs> right <laughs> work without a pay for bunch of time yeah so So tell us about in moment the what was the concept what what's the product we mentioned customer experience but what were you guys doing what was like what were you doing for great clips for example was the product so we were a b2c solution for customer success customer experience right everyone calls it nps today but nps didn't exist back then it was customer satisfaction and we were that survey at the bottom of the receipt So if you go and buy something at a a restaurant or at a store, a lot of times you'll see that survey, that call to action at the bottom. Give us your feedback, get a free dessert or whatever it might be, right? Sure. And that's pretty much what we were. We were like, hey, you know, we can do this, offer the solution out and be able to get feedback to local store managers about how their business is running. Tell them when customers are upset, recover customers that might flee, right? And and that's, that's the problem is like customers talk with their feet. They don't necessarily tell you. And so if you get them to talk to you, that was the whole premise of this is happy customers. You know, that's the focus, right? How do I make my customers happy? It makes sense. And did it evolve? Because I, I think I, I read a couple articles in preparation for this, qual, like Qualtrics and the survey side. And how did you guys, I guess, was there competition there? I think it was somewhat similar timing with Qualtrics and how, what they, they were doing. They may have started, <clears throat> pardon me, about a year or two before us. I'm trying to remember. I think they may have started in 2000, okay. I think. Yeah, I think we that's We started in 2002. Right. And so they were a survey company, specifically a survey tool. We started from the beginning being a solution for businesses to manage their customer success. And Qualtrics started as a survey tool that could serve, be used to run surveys. Sure. So we didn't run into them for, golly, over 10 years. Okay. And, um, you know, and we were built up for B2C transactional. And, and they were built, even when they started coming to the space, more B2B. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. They, they were still more B2B. We started running into them more and more, but... Not as much as I would expect. Yeah, makes sense. And going back to the, the early days, it sounds like about a year or so without a salary. You had 10, 10, about 10 employees at the beginning. Um, I, I do like to ask just when people start companies, I, I, you know, assuming it's going to be very successful, there might be an exit down the road. Equity becomes very important. Yeah. Um, and ownership. I mean, how did you think about that in the early days? You're like, what advice would you have? You know, if, if two partners have an idea, how you split that up, how you give equity to new employees who aren't being compensated with a salary. How do you guys think about that? So I, I'm one that it's, if you share, I'll, I'll, get, I'll tell a story. I'm, Please. Sorry, I'm getting older, so I tell stories. <laughs> I love it. So um, there's a guy on, on a boat with uh, five of his buds, and uh, there's 90 pounds of gold in the boat, but the boat's sinking. <laughs> what are the chances that that one guy can swim with 90 pounds of gold a half mile to shore. Not very good. It's pretty, pretty poor. Yeah. <laughs> right. But if he divvies it out among his friends, he gives everybody 15 pounds. We're going to get all 90 pounds to the shore. It's going to be hard. Not easy to swim. Like a kind of weight on your back, but it's doable, right? You, you desperate people will do, we can summon up the will to do it. And, and that's to me is the most important thing is sharing the wealth. I just, I mean, it doesn't make sense to go through and not, uh, especially with the kind of sacrifices that are made by small startup companies. Uh, we've got a lot of sacrifices being made by people right now at Halosite because it's like the, the economy has been slow to respond and it's been waiting for these opportunities to happen. People make a lot of sacrifices and it's kind of crazy not to share. And there are companies here in, in Silicon Slopes that haven't shared that have had huge billion dollar exits. And I've been kind of stunned when I find out that nine employees out of 3000 have stock. I'm like kind of shocked. I mean, when we sold off, um, in moment, there were probably around 70 people that pay, could pay off their mortgage with the amount. Wow. And that's just, it's just such a different story. Right. Yeah. So we shared the wealth among the company. And, and I think that's important. And obviously it's, it's a graduated scale of who's valuable and what, but, you can see it all the way through of people making those sacrifices that they can have a, a life changing event. If you can pick up a few hundred thousand dollars in your twenties, I mean, it's like a game changer. Then yeah. you could have own a home and you can go out and start your own company because your mortgage is paid. 
It's just a game changer. Well, nowadays, mortgages are huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Crap, you need like half a million bucks now to buy a home. Jeez. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that story, John. I think that's yeah. great, a great kind of analogy or metaphor or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and I think that's spot on because it helps with retention. I think it helps with employee uh, loyalty and people sticking around and all that. So I think that's definitely the right approach. Um, so uh, in moment, 17 years, you're building yep. this company. Um, I, I think I read you had offices in across the country and oh, yeah. 400 plus employees or so. And um, I turned into something really massive and established. So um, yeah, I mean, d- during that experience, did you guys end up raising capital? I always like to ask about, you know, raising capital, how, how that process went and what you guys did to do that. You know, we had a, a couple of rounds we did, although we didn't do any venture capital there. It just wasn't available at the time. Mm-hmm. I may have chosen to do it, but it just wasn't available at the time. So we ended up building the company, organically growing it, and then bringing in some primary, secondary through some PEs uh, a couple different times. One time to give a little, little liquidity off the table because it had been like eight, nine years, and it was like, hey, let's take some off the table. Let's yeah. enjoy life a little bit. Sure. No reason to wait till the end of this ride to sit there and finally go through them, you know, buy an ice cream cone. <laughs> we can have one along the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so that was, and that's the advice to people. So they say, you know, some people are like, I got to wait all the way till the end. I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, you're going to have to evaluate yourself, but you got only so many years and it might be good to enjoy a little bit along the way. Right. <laughs> and so you're like, Oh, I could have made five times as much if I didn't sell any. Yeah. But you, you had 10 years of boating and playing with your kids and doing stuff. And it's true. Like, I mean, that's just freaking awesome. Yeah. So I'm, I'm grateful. I took some money off the table. Yeah. So there's a nod to my, my PE buddies at Sorensen for giving me some money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then my buddies over Absolutely. at Peterson who threw some money towards us to do an acquisition that ultimately led up to the sale of our company. So okay. both, both of them were great partners to work with and I gladly work with them again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, those are, you know, very renowned, well-established groups here in Utah that have a great reputation. I did want to talk a little bit about the transition out and kind of yeah. the sale to Dearborn. So what was the, I mean, talk about catalyst, you know, you're 17 years into this, what, what was the driver to be like, Hey, you know what we had a, this has been a great run. We're time to time to exit. And I, I think you have to always be around and you keep your eyes up and say, when is the right time? Uh, and if you're, if you're the only one that's saying you want to hold on, maybe, maybe the time already came and went and you missed the window. And so I think that's an important thing to say, well, when is the right time on this thing? And for me, I started, we started evaluating it, looking at it as a group and saying, you know, it's the right time. It's time to go through and do this. I actually went to the board and said, I think we should bring in a different CEO. I'll step back into a chief scientist role and just support the sale of the company at that point in time. And that was a good way because by the time the company sold, I wasn't the CEO and it was able to be sold off. And there's something to be said about not having to be the CEO and saying, well, they're going to lock you up for another three to five years. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. kind of sucks. Because <laughs> my goal was to go and start something again. And that, right. was, that was the exciting part is I was free to go do that. Got it. So, yeah, it's, that's a great strategy because to your point, a lot of times when there's a sale, you, you do get the golden handcuffs. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, stick around for another three or four years. It's part of the deal. And so smart move. And then how did you guys get connected with, with Madison Dearborn? That's who ultimately acquired you out of we, Chicago. We correct? ran a process. Okay. And we ran a process with uh, a group we'd chosen to kind of go through and, and you know, take us around. Yeah. And so that's ultimately how we ended up with them. Okay. And that, what year was that, that you guys sold? Uh, it was coming up on five years ago. Yeah. Okay. It was five years ago in May. 2018, 19, 2019 yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, so you, you sell, you'd already had a, a, a liquidity event sounds like a little bit earlier, but what, I mean, what was that moment like for you? I mean, you, as an entrepreneur, I think, a lot of times you imagine the end game is like some exit, some windfall of, of your net worth or your capital. I mean, what, what was that moment like for you? You know, it was kind of this relief that it's, that it, you can finally, you know, using a Sharpie pen on, on a permanent wall <laughs> that you did it right. Because up to that point in time, you're kind of this, you're, you're hoping for that event. And, and so, and it's interesting as you meet around other founders that have had an exit, it's just different. It's just kind of like, you know, I have a group that I ski with on Fridays and everybody's just had an exit. And this, there's just kind of a different feel as we talk about different things. Cause it's, it's now, you know, part of you, you've gotten, you finalized it. You didn't, you didn't hold on to the end and watch the whole thing implode on yourself. Which right. I've seen that too. You walk around, you see people that just hold on for too long. Yeah. And uh, it's hard as a founder because, you know, being able to step away is hard. It just is. 
and but you got to be able to be willing to do that yeah it's great it's great insight so you you have the sale i'm sure you could have probably just sailed off into the sunset and done a lot more skiing but halo site yeah so how long after you sell uh in moment did you did you want to launch we we launched it pretty quick and um really really began coding uh the summer after the sale and that's when we began coding and, and <clears throat> really kind of getting into it it was interesting because you know ai has gone nuts uh, last year i mean most people wouldn't have been able to say what it was and then suddenly chat gp comes along and everyone's like ai is everything mm -hmm. it's going to destroy the world and <laughs> every single sci-fi book's true and, and i'm like oh my gosh stop it <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's gonna be a billion robots running around everywhere you know you know whatever i'm just but <laughs> that's like so it's kind of kind of crazy mm -hmm. just to be honest with you yeah and so you know so we started this ai company uh, coming up on five years ago not quite five years now and um and it was really kind of, you know, I look back at it and I go, wow, we, we started this up and got into this thing before it kind of became this crazy thing. And we focus on the conversations that exist between customers and business. So conversation AI is really our focus. So we use three kind of core techniques to extract those conversations from, the, from email, text, chats, Zooms, Hangouts, whatever. I mean, every single type of, of conversation. Uh, 90 plus percent of the data that any business has is conversational data from their customers and they don't use any of it for decision making. Mm. And so that's kind of our core. So the first is what we call text AI. And that's the ability to go through and extract, basically break down an unstructured conversation into structured pieces of data. So an email comes in and it's three paragraphs. That's one kind of piece of information when it comes in that you can't do anything with. We'll break that down into 800 structured pieces of data that then we can do automation and other things on. We can extract it from the information from there automatically, kick off different processes and stuff. So that's kind of a cool first step. The second one is, is, is machine learning type AI, where you're looking at uplift models and predictions and recommendation models. That's where you want to have your data from your conversations tell me the best thing to do. And then the last piece is the one everyone's heard of is generative and all your LLMs. And that's great at going through and doing different types of efficiency things. And so we use all three of those in our conversation AI to go through and coach people and guide people to have the best conversations always with their customers. Very interesting. So what, what would be an example of that? So if I'm a, uh, you know, a software user, I'm, or I have Salesforce and I'm, having dialogue, I guess, is it like internal dialogue between teams or is it like, I, I sometimes I go on a website and a little AI bot pops yeah. up. It's like, Hey, ask, what do you need from me? Is it? Yeah. And I'm I'll, just I'll looking for my example. I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, one of our clients, uh, advanced auto parts. Okay. Uh, they, um, they have around 6,000 stores and thousand plus sales reps. And so each rep has, you know, five, five or six stores. And, um, they're supposed to visit all the mechanics and car dealerships around each of those stores. And they have to do that in about a six week cycle. And that's actually what makes most of their money. They don't make much money selling windshield wipers to you and me. <laughs> they make money selling expensive brake pads and shocks to the mechanics of car dealerships. Got it. So they're, they're more bricks and clicks than they are windshield wipers and, mm. and fluid and stuff. And so they have to go and visit all those places and they have, they have a pretty big checklist. I think it's over 50 different items they're supposed to check before they go and meet that particular customer. So they got to go through all the past notes, past correspondence, past support issues, any kind of product recalls or product you know failures, any kind of you know, campaign deals or anything else that are going on. So it's a whole lot, right? They spend between one and two hours prepping for each meeting. Well, we process all that unstructured data, run it through this pregame checklist, and say, talk to them about these three things. Mm. Now it's five minutes of prep. They yeah. get two days back a week. It's game changer, right? Sure. So you you get a couple things going. You get the McDonald's effect because everybody's doing the same thing. Consistency is important in a business. So you're all all boys in the boat are rowing, right? Yeah, that's an important first thing. The next thing is efficiency. Hey, I just saved two days a week. <laughs> that's like crazy right 33 plus percent is typically what we see when that's first deployed that's just the efficiency improvements let alone the accuracy of what you're doing can i sell more stuff and do more because i'm actually doing the best thing yeah that's the goal so those are the, and the uplift you get in that so that's a good example of how we help what i would call the pre-game prep list um 
Another example is what we call real-time coaching. So without naming this particular customer, they have thousands of stores and sell and have a sales force that has a high turnover because it's in retail. Sure. And they do it all by SMS messaging. So they do around 22 million SMS messages a year. A lot of messages. And their goal is to go through and, and you know sell more stuff, right? And so they asked us, we were brought in by Salesforce and Salesforce will bring us in for these kind of tough, challenging questions because Salesforce sells software. They don't sell answers per se. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're like, we can come in and help you get answers from your data. And so they bring us in and the question was, hey, we want to know what conversations are leading to closes by our people. In other words, can you do a win-loss analysis for us, but only use conversational data? Mm. And I was like... Wow, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, I saw. I talked to my CTO and I said, "You want to try this one? <laughs> this is kind of a new. This is kind of a new bag." And uh, this was last year. It was a huge breakthrough for us, by the way, uh, because we'd done a lot of analysis, done a lot of things with the conversational data, but to be able to correlate which conversations lead to a close just by looking at the conversational data, it was a mind bender for me. I was like, "Holy crap!" And when we did it, the team basically came with a solution in just a couple days. Now, a lot of this had to do with all the groundwork we'd laid leading up to this, all the building up of the text AI over 30 different enrichment techniques, all the machine learning and all the other pieces with generative we were doing all rolled in to say, tell me what the best people are saying that lead to a close. In other words, can you recreate my top sales rep and what they do in my lowest rep? Mm. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? Right. Well, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a cool breakthrough. So for us, that's been a game changer. We launched it this last, formally this last December uh, at uh, the New York World Tour for Salesforce. And so that's kind of the real-time piece of saying, hey, I want to be able to go through and come up with plays that lead me to closes and then coach me through those plays. And now we can do that in real time. And then the last piece we do is a post-game wrap-up. So you and I are meeting here. We're having a discussion when we're done. I might go write down some notes. I might go make a follow-up appointment. I might send out a reminder. I might thank you as well, right? All those things come up. Well, that's stuff that salespeople are terrible at. <laughs> I don't mean to be mean. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a lot of details that it's just kind of like, oh, I gotta go do all this stuff now after I've had a one hour meeting creates three hours of work, right? And you're like, okay, it's good, but I gotta go do all this stuff. And so what we've done now is create the ability to automate. We call it our note pilot. And so as I'm typing, we actually process what the rep is typing and guide them saying, hey, what else happened in the meeting? Who else did you talk to? Because we know the play they're supposed to have run. And we can then ask the rep to get it. If they didn't get it, they're going to get it. And the follow-up recommendation on the next pregame checklist. Hey, you didn't do this. You should have done this. Go do it. So it's kind of cool the way it works out. And ultimately, when they finish typing, we can take from their note, automatically create their follow-up email, send out their reminders, go through and calendar it, and then you know any other automations you want to kick off because conversational AI allows us to break down what they're typing and automate that function for them. So those are the kind of, yeah. that's the bookends, right? From pregame checklist all the way to the postgame wrap-up of a sales play, and then run another play again. And that's what we're doing. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's amazing. So your, your ideal customer is, is really anyone who's selling something who's using Salesforce because you integrate primarily with Salesforce. Sales, Salesforce is our prime you know, landing area, um, but we do work outside. Our whole pipeline runs on Google. Okay. So do we run this for other people with the other di different data fabrics? Yeah, we do. Yeah. But Salesforce is the prime area and there's 160 plus thousand businesses on it. So it's a sure. pretty big round. Yeah. Um, obviously that's for sales teams, but we also do this for re basically RevOps teams. So your customer success team, hey, what am I doing to retain my customers? What conversations are leading to customers leaving? What conversations are leading to customers being, you know, renewing? Those things are critical to any business. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a client here. Well, they, they acquired a big business here, a billion dollar company here in Utah that we're working with right now for customer retention. It's just, it works great because the data is in those conversations. And that's what we're able to go through and say, let's have the best conversations. Let's make sure we know from what conversations lead to customers renewing. And let's make sure we're having those kind of conversations. So guiding people again, a customer success rep gets their pregame checklist of, I need to talk with the customer about these three things to make sure I move towards my renewal.
Yeah. I mean, it sounds like extre- an extremely effective way to use AI and it's something that at least I hadn't heard of until, you know, we, you've explained this to me. A very, it seems like a very great tool for companies to integrate and, and just take themselves to that next level on both the sales and retention. It's, it's been a side. cool application. It's not, I mean, we do use generative, but we heavily use our text AI and machine learning to do the analysis and come up with the plays and then to be able to track where you're at in a play. And so that, that's, that's been kind of a combination of all three of those pieces of AI that have allowed us to build this out. Yeah, it's great. Well, so you're about five years in, yep. I mean, similar, similar questions to in moment, but I mean, how, how have the first, you know, how's, how's it been getting off the ground, um, raising capital? Have you, yeah. How, how have you guys gotten off the ground here in the last you know, few years? We knew it was going to be a couple of years of R and D when we, when we started into it. But then COVID hit, and that was kind of a bummer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kind of, and I know all my buddies that uh, have started up tech companies, COVID was rough on startups. It just really was. A bunch of them died off or kind of ended up morphing into things that, that they're less of what they once were. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's say that. And so that that was definitely a challenge. What we did, and thankfully, we chose to keep building out because we really felt that if we could break down and really have this conversational AI, we were going to be able to do all these other things. And those moments came only because we'd built out that, that, that capability. Without have, if we would have pivoted somewhere else and just said, oh, this isn't working, and we did do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't pivot, but we kept the core of, of our capabilities saying, let's really figure out how to break down conversations, how to use conversations. That was at our core. We tried to apply it in that a few different ways. And frankly, the breakthroughs came when we were in that desperate situation saying, how do we go through and truly do these hard things? And because we built up enough capability, we were able to go through and pivot right into something that was like beyond slam dunk to be able to have an AI conversation coach solution. Yeah. It's, it's been a game changer for us. Yeah, absolutely. I think that happens at every company though. You have those moments where you have this moment of desperation and you have to do something and you try harder than you did any other time up to that point in time. And that innovation happens at that moment. Mm-hmm. That's what it did for us again. It happened to us at, at, at in moment and other companies as well. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like as soon as you're ready to almost throw in the towel, you just keep pushing that one last push and something, something good happens. What's your, what's your current role right now, John, at the company? CEO and run the business. It's a, I'm, I'm, I'm a big product CEO. There's different types of CEOs. I'm sure you've got the finance CEO and, You've got the Rava CEO. I'm a little bit of the Rava CEO too, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, and the fundraising CEO. So I'm I kind of I, I wear a few of the different kind of role hats. Yeah, uh, but I really love the product side of things. It's where my background has been. It's where I kind of grew up, and so I love the creation side. So I, I, I try to stay real close in that. We do a our CTO came up with this really kind of cool thing. We do it's the demo to the CEO uh, every week and get a chance to see the latest pieces there. And we get different people showing up with different ideas and you get a chance to kind of say, oh, that'd be a kind of cool thing. And that's where really a, a lot of our magics come from. It's like, there's not a designated person. It's like, you're in charge of being creative. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> no, it's like, we're in charge of this. We all can go through and innovate and great ideas come from all sources. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, what is your, what are your thoughts on the Utah tech landscape right now? I, I think you mentioned COVID had an yeah. impact. I, we're here early 2024. I, I've heard that it's, it's a, been a little bit turbulent with, yeah. I've had friends and people that I know get laid off and uh, I know raising money might be a little bit more challenging right now, but yeah. What, what are your thoughts on, on uh, the landscape? Yeah, that's great questions. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I sat on the board of one company that's, you know, really struggling and the CEO had to step down and, and uh, basically now it's just being run by a, a couple of people. Hopefully it's going to survive. It's on life support, right? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of business, a lot of startups were put on life support or had their doors closed. Uh, big software companies you know, here in Utah, the tech companies, you've seen 15 to 30% layoffs. It's, that sucks. You know, this, I think we kind of expanded and, and there was a lot of hope and then everything just kind of imploded with stuff. And I, I, I'm not worried about the, the, the tech sector here in Utah from a standpoint of that, but I think, I think there's still some damage that hasn't worked its way through the system. So I think you'll see a few more businesses with you know, tech companies with layoffs still and uh, or really delayed kind of growth. Like there won't be job openings for a while from those types of companies. Mm-hmm. Um, from the ones that laid off and, and looked at it, I mean, we're, we'll be looking at hiring here come this summer with 
the, the, the different projects and things we have going on. But I, I think the, for those that didn't, and we did, we, we had to do some layoffs. We did furloughs, you know, where we hope we can bring the people back you know, as we've gone through those things. Um, those are tough times. You, you hate having to do that because it's, they're all your friends. Right. And uh, I think when people just read about some lady who laid off like their whole staff and she just wore sunglasses so she didn't have to make eye contact. This is, I was this last week. That's uh, one way to do magazine. it, I guess. I can't even remember which one it was. But Cond Nast Traveler. Sorry, I hate to name the lady. <laughs> I was like, really? Yeah. Like, uh, if, if you're going to let someone go, talk with them, sit down with them, shake their hand. Be available for them. Be a reference for them. Help them find a job. Help them review their resume. Just, just don't like kick them out on the street. That's just yeah. wrong. I just so uh, I mean, just how how committed are you to these people? Well, obviously they shouldn't have been that committed to you. So right, you know, yeah. I don't know. To me, it's personal. Right. No, it make, makes sense. It's, way, it's just way to approach it. Um, what's what's your thought? I mean, ultimate plan, I guess, with uh, with your current company. I mean, what, what are you thinking about, you know, raising capital or timeline? It's set with 17 years within moment. I mean, you're five years in here. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts? We um, we've we've brought in money from Album as well as from Rev Road. Both have been okay. great partners to us, very supportive. And um, and it's been kind of wild watching the AI space take off. Um, our breakthroughs on some key pieces that are, are good IP for us. Uh, inside of Salesforce, the app exchange, um, the companies that they've acquired, they've acquired 70 plus companies here in the last five years, six years, I guess. And they're typically acquiring companies that are around 20 times sales. Their AI companies they've recently acquired have been 30 times sales. So I feel pretty good <laughs> about things yeah. from the standpoint if we can be successful enough to attract Salesforce. We're talking with their venture group right now. We've had a couple conversations with them and we're looking to do a raise this summer, uh, probably late summer is when we're looking to do it. Just, I want to have our ducks in a row and stuff ready for that. Uh, but the right pieces are coming to coming together that way. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah. I love it. And when you, when you take, you know, VC capital or private equity capital, obviously there's exchange there, ownership, oh, yeah. et cetera. <laughs> uh, yeah. How do you, I mean, what's the strategy there? Choosing the right partner, how much you take on, how much you give up. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to probably represent more of the old school in these things. To me, I don't like taking a lot of money just for the sake that it was available. Um, I, th I think those days are kind of gone, to be honest with you. I think those days are gone. They, they were, there were days where everyone was taking money and then bragging about how much money they took by sticking it up on a billboard. I'm like, yes. I'm like, I, I, if I see another billboard, I'm going to be surprised. <laughs> I think the, well, the board's going to fire those people. Yeah. Like, why did you do that? Um, yep. So I think those days are gone. Uh, but to me, this is kind of pushing me a bit because the AI space is moving so fast. I, I really can't afford to, to organically grow it. And I think that's the question you need to ask yourself is what kind of space are you in? What, what kind of, you know, that, that really dictates in the opportunity you have of how much capital you should try to bring in. And, and you should always be trying to say, can I do it with less? I mean, it's just, I it's just, there's no reason to spend your treasure. Uh, it just, it just, you, you got to keep your powder dry because you never know how many rounds you're going to have to go for. And if you end up just basically liquidating your company before you're successful, I mean, God, one of the companies we acquired, I remember talking to the, the CEO after I'd bought the company and he worked for me for like six months after that. And, and we became good friends and he was telling me how he goes, you know how much money I made on the sale of this company. And I'm like, I know how much money I paid for the company, but I, I hadn't done the math down to him. And you know, maybe I should have, I don't know. I, I hadn't done that. I was just, but he, I said, no, I, I don't Mike. How much did you make? And he's like, well, I made 150,000. And I'm like, 12 years of a startup and he goes, but that's not the worst part. I'm like, what's the worst part? Like that sounds pretty bad to yeah. me because <laughs> I don't know how many times he went without paying everything else. And he goes, he goes, I just got divorced. So I only get half of that. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, Oh man, this is brutal. So those, that, those are the thoughts that I always go bad through the back of my head is that there's, there's always a, a price to pay when you take money. Uh, people mean well, when they give you money, they want results. Uh, if you take a lot of money, they want a lot of results. So why put yourself in that situation? Think Rumpelstiltskin. Do you really want to give up your firstborn? <laughs> yeah. Do you really want to lose them? And, and yet they, they can be a fantastic lever for you if you just be careful with it. Uh, don't take too much money. Don't be you know, doing it. 
And yet I'm, I, I asked a bunch of, of friends that have raised money that have raised big money and said, what do you think I should do in this situation? Should I raise more than my tendency is? And they're all telling me, you, yeah, I probably should this round. <laughs> I probably should go beyond what I'm comfortable with and go for a bigger round because the space is fast moving. It's ridiculously fast moving. And so I don't want to miss the opportunity. So I'll probably go for a bigger round this year. Yeah, that's great advice, John. I think yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a great balance you outlined there and a lot, lot to consider when you're doing it. Um, yeah, shifting a, a little bit and we'll wrap up here, but you mentioned RevRoad invested into, yep. into your project. I saw that you were uh, like a mentor and yep. investor with them as well. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about, I mean, outside of Halo site, you, you're, you're involved with BYU founders and RevRoad and kind of what you do to give back a little bit. I, I, I love being, you know, kind of going and doing some mentoring. I think it's great. I think, I think you, you get better with being an, an actual CEO and a, an entrepreneur by actually helping someone else out. You know, the whole exercise of helping answer someone else's problem helps you. It really does. And so, you, I mean, you should do it for more reasons than that. <laughs> I mean, I read that the wrong way, but I'm like, you're going to learn a lot too. And you should make the time and you should put back in. And, and, and most uh, entrepreneurs do. Uh, the BYU Founders Group is great. Uh, it's, it's the biggest one in the network up there. I think it's fantastic. Um, I, I'd like to see that we do it more at the U. I got a degree from both schools and, yeah. and I just, you know, I've, I went up, I've go up and speak every now and then at the U and at the Y. And, and I think that's important for people to give back and go back and speak and, and, and talk because I don't think people understand how the stuff works, you know, at the education level. Yeah. So I think going in and speaking in classrooms and talking about some of the stuff, I mean, it's, it's important to be able to kind of get through that. Yeah. And uh, hopefully create more entrepreneurs out of it. I mean, I wish someone would have come into my classroom and told me my biggest regret is I was 32 when I started my first company up instead of 22. Sure. That, that's my biggest regret. Yeah. I, I took 10 years to go out and try it. Yeah. That's, so. that's a great lesson learned. And I, I remember being at BYU and having some of these entrepreneurship lecture series, and that really was what ignited my desire to do it. And Were you um, with Scott Peterson? Well, so I was going to say, Scott was on this podcast like two weeks ago. Uh, so he's freaking awesome. He's, he's a stud. And yeah. he's one of my investors. So I love him. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. It was, that was a great, was, yeah. that was a great conversation we had. Um, last couple of questions, just in, in terms of investing. So you've, you've uh, had success, you've had some liquidity. Um, yeah. I mean, how do you think about the, you know, the John Sperry portfolio when you think about investing across the landscape and in different, in different buckets? Yeah, I think, I think that's an important thing. It's like, you know, you've, you've, you've made your money. Do you keep it all in your company as you leave? Um, I, you can see that with some people have a lot of money, but most people are like, okay, I need to transition and do something different and create some different buckets um, for, and, and it, this is a, it's going to be a personal thing, but for me, uh, we kind of broke up money in a few ways to say, Hey, where's, this is our giving fund. So we put our money into a DAF. If you don't know what a DAF is, go look one up. It allows you to go through and take your highly, you know, uh, you know, uh, high equity stock. It has a lot of tax associated with it and give it right over into a charity. And then that money can then be diverted over the years to different charities. It's great. It's a great way to do it. People should do it all the time. So anybody who's liquidates, you know, their company should set up a DAF and, and they, they can give a lot of money out. So that's, that's one. My wife runs that. And, you know, we're looking to put more into that as well. So and, and to be able to do different types of donations. And we just recently helped um, Hives down in Lehigh. Uh, it's called the Curtis Center. It's right across the street from the new primary children's okay. hospital. Yeah. Uh, it's on 40 acres there. It's for special needs kids. It's a great thing. We just finished raising $10 million there and getting wow. them their building put in place. It's an awesome thing. That's great. It's an awesome thing. Love so that. That, that's, that's one bucket you, you should be thinking about is how do I help that way? Um, you need to give of yourself to time, right? And that's why the mentor piece, if you break it out, that's an investment too. So where am I putting time in? I, I put time in and speaking to universities. Uh, I put time on boards, on startups. Um, and I put time in mentoring individual students who I try to spend time with and talk with. Yeah, that's um, great. Personal investments. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're going to, you're going to have your own kind of breakdown on these things, but I, I like to have a breakdown between some fixed assets like land, uh, some producing assets like properties, and then of course investments. And then I personally 
let my wife kind of get the sign off on those pieces mm -hmm. so she feels comfortable. And then you've got, you know, I've got to actually a separate fund for retirement. Uh, but then I take a small bit, call it the crazy fund. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it's, you know, probably represents, you know, five, 10% of my wealth. And I get to invest in crazy stuff. Yeah. And they're all startups. They're all high risk and they all can go to zero. <laughs> you know, it's like, they're all like, you know, like you put your money in there, you're throwing it. And it's like, Foo, that's it. Well, that went that way. Yeah. But it's great because you get a good chance and, and believe in people. And, you know, it's one thing to go through and give someone's advice. It's another to go through and throw them a hundred thousand. Yeah. You know, so, and that's why I like Rev Road too, is I think it's an alternate. I mean, most software companies are only going to be worth around 30 million bucks. And that's the thing that nobody knows. <laughs> it's like, oh, what are the chances that your big startup that you're thinking is going to be worth a bajillion dollars, that it's only worth 30 million? Really high. <laughs> yeah. Like 90 plus percent of the software companies, just that's what they're worth. It's mm -hmm. 30 million bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's grown a little bit, but that was like five years old. That's uh, so probably been about five years. So maybe they're close to 50 million now. Yeah. But that's the reality is that most are not these ginormous unicorns. So how do you build that company and be successful? Well, there's a lot of ways, but not if you take 10 million bucks, 20 million bucks, you're not going to do it, right? You just, because those people are expecting a 10 times return on their money. So you don't take 10 million bucks. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you got to take something smaller, build something smaller. And that's what I like about Rev Road is, is that they're, they're out there for the base hits. They're yeah. the Oakland A's of, of investment. So yeah. I, I love doing that. And that's where most investments should be. Most investments are base hits. And there's no reason that can't be a success. It's not a success when you put two money into it, right? And or, or or your expectations are just whacked up. But I know plenty of people. That's those are that's a great business. <laughs> yep. I'm sure you you'd like to own a fifty million dollar business. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> not yeah. a bad thing. Yeah. So so that that's 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 kind of my round yeah. of of investment advice. Yeah, um, I love that. Choose someone good to help you. I don't have time to manage my my stocks and stuff like that. But you get enough money, you should invest directly in stocks instead of mutual funds. You get a lot better kind of management of your tax and and uh, and of your taxes that way. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, and and I yeah, I've heard that a crazy fund or moonshot fund. I think that's yeah. that's always good to have. Well, last last question I wanted to ask you, and this is something I ask all my all my guests, John, is to talk about. We talk a lot about business and other other avenues, but when you think about success, when you think about a life well lived, or you know w why we're here. I guess, what, how do you define success in your life holistically? You know, um, in starting up Halo site, I have a lot of people that have worked with in the past want to work with me again. And I, I want to work with them. And um, I look at the group of people, the 20 plus people that we have over there uh, who have worked with many of them for 15, 20, 25 years even. Um, a lot of them this time around well, actually all of them at the Halo site had said, I want to have a wealth event instead of I want a job. There's a difference, right? And in order to have a wealth event, you're going to need to make a trade-off. You're going to sacrifice salary for equity. And everybody at the company has done that. And it's a sheer joy to work with these people who have made that kind of decision and have that many people that in. So, what represents success for me is seeing those people with a wealth event. And that's just awesome. That's what I'm, that's what I'm committed to doing. That's what I'm, that's what drives me right now. Um, and you know, yeah, I want a success, but I want to see the success for the team there like desperately. And so that's an exciting thing for me to be able to be a part of that and have people saying that committed. There's something about that whole foxhole mentality when everyone's in you know, mm -hmm. the boys in the boat, whatever, whatever analogy you want to give that's when it really pays off when it's not like I'm doing this just for me. And it's just a me who's going to make all this money. Like, really? No, I, I'm, I'm doing this with them and all of us are doing it for each other. And that's a cool place to be. That's just, and you know, you, I feel really lucky that I have a chance to do that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm no doubt you guys will be successful. Uh, I'm excited to see your continued growth. And again, want to thank you, John, for sharing your story and insights. It was, it was fantastic. Glad to be here. Thanks for listening to The Chase Hudson Show. If you liked what you heard, please leave me a review and subscribe to this podcast. Reviews really help us to find better guests and to improve the overall quality of the show. If you'd like to connect with me directly or want to learn more about investing in real estate, send me a DM on Instagram at official Chase Hudson. Again, we really appreciate you listening and we'll talk to you on the next episode.